this, and it was a typo. It said Monday, Thursday, cone. And people were wondering, like, what's that? And so thankfully, I, I really quickly changed it. Um, but before we start, uh, let me say I'm, a lot of you have been asking me about how Father John is doing. He's doing extremely well uh, from what I hear. He is uh, <laughs> making a great re recovery. He's out and about with the kids and with Liz, and uh, he's fine, completely fine. Uh, not out of the weeds yet, so please keep praying for him, too, and for the Jordan family as a whole. Okay, so we're picking up uh, still at the Last Supper. This is sort of... We're finishing up, you know, the tail end of supper, and Jesus has been giving his disciples some, you know, last-minute lessons on how they're supposed to live uh, once Jesus is gone, once they don't have him anymore. And he began the night by washing their feet, by humbling himself and serving them, and then he commands them to serve each other, to make this a pattern in their life. And then he decides to get real serious, and he says, truly one of you will betray me. And this is the, uh, you know, world-famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. The moment Jesus says, one of you will betray me, and you can kind of see the, the bewilderment on all of the apostles' faces, because all of them are thinking, surely it's not me, surely it's not me. And then Jesus reveals to the beloved disciple of John uh, that it would be Judas. And then, a little bit later, Peter says, well, I would never deny you. In fact, wherever you're going, I'm going to follow you with all my heart, even to death. And Jesus says, actually, Peter, tonight you're going to deny me three times. And he belabors the fact, saying, guys, where I'm going, you can't follow me. And so, there, the disciples are obviously visibly upset. Anxious. They've been following this guy around for three years now. He's not just their, their teacher. He's not just the rabbi. He's one of their closest friends. And now, after everything, after all they've been through, he's about to leave them, and he says, you can't go where I'm going. Not yet. And so this is sort of uh, where we drop into chapter 14. And chapter 14, uh, the theme of it is uh, basically Jesus comforting his disciples. He's trying to tell them, no, don't be that upset. Don't be that upset. It's going to be okay. This is sort of the theme that sets the tone for uh, this latter part of the Last Supper in chapter 14 of John's Gospel. So, the theme, don't worry, be happy. And he starts off with that very first, first verse. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Have faith in me. <coughs> Have faith in what I'm doing because I know what I'm doing. We talked last week about how Jesus is in complete control even now. Even when the night seems darkest, even when he's getting betrayed, even when the Pharisees want to kill him, Jesus is in control and he's powerful. This is the book of glory, not the book of sadness or cowardice. It's a book of glory where Jesus is basically giving uh, his marching orders to the disciples. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to be gone, but here, these are your instructions. This is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to do. It's going to be okay. The disciples are about to embark on the greatest adventure of all of mankind, of spreading mm -hmm. God's kingdom. They don't know it yet. They're afraid. But Jesus is saying, don't be afraid, believe in me. So yeah, he's trying to instill some degree of confidence in his disciples in chapter 14, after he's dropped all these, uh, all these truth bombs on them. And really he's saying that his leaving is a good thing. His leaving is a good thing because he's going to his father, and his father is great. So be happy, don't worry. And he says... So he's going to his father's house. He says, in my father's house there are many, many mansions. If it were not so, wouldn't I have told you? And it's one of my favorite Camp Crucis songs uh, where he talks about that. And a lot of people think that, uh, they kind of take it at face value, that, oh, Jesus is going up there to, you know, you know, adjust the wall hangings or, you know, make the bed for me when I get there. 
that's actually not really what Jesus means. And what Jesus actually means is sort of it has is sort of twofold. First, we can interpret this in light of the new house that Christ is building, <coughs> i.e., the church. Okay? And so this kind of goes back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, one of my favorite passages in all the Old Testament. Because this is the chapter where David, after you know, finally becoming king of his of all Israel, says, you know what, I want to make God a house. I want to make him a temple, a tabernacle. And uh, God really replies to uh, Nathan, his prophet in a vision, to tell David, saying, actually, no, you're not the one to build me a house. But, because I like you, I'm going to build you a house. And your house and your dynasty will reign forever. And so, uh, David's offspring does build a house for God. The temple, the tabernacle, the tabernacle can be translated into God's house. God's house among his people. That's the temple. But also, he says that uh, this house will be uh, established forever. And that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus, uh, where are we at? Jesus is not only the fulfillment of the Davidic pro prophecy that he is David's uh, <coughs> descendant, you know, the son of David, the new king. He's also the new temple, as Jesus himself describes himself, saying, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Jesus is the new temple. And he is also the fulfillment of the prophecy that David's throne would be established forever. So, what does this mean for the church? Well, Jesus goes up to heaven, but... Through the giving of the Holy Spirit, which he talks about later in the chapter, he establishes his body still on earth. So although Jesus is in heaven, he is also on earth, present in his church, which is his body. Literally, God's house. We are the temple by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of our inclusion into Christ's body. Is that making sense? So when Jesus goes to prepare a place for us, he's preparing the church. He's preparing us for baptism. He's preparing us to partake in that heavenly city, though that mansion that is still on earth, made possible by the Holy Spirit and through our baptism, through our inclusion in it. So that's sort of the first meaning of, uh, of Jesus going to prepare a place for us. But the, the next meaning is actually rooted in the incarnation itself. Jesus had to become man in order for us to have a place in heaven, to have a place in God's kingdom. Why is that so? Hopefully you're asking yourself that. And so I prepared for you a really, really long extended quotation from Cyril of Alexandria that I tried my hardest to break up into pieces. And I'll read it to you. Cyril of Alexandria, sort of an old church guy who's very uh, foundational in developing the Alexandrian church. He says, For in times of old, heaven was utterly inaccessible to mortals, and no flesh has yet had ever traveled that pure and all holy realm of the angels. But Christ was the first who consecrated for us the means of access to himself, and granted to flesh a way of entrance into heaven. So, at first, humanity was not able to enter into heaven, because... Heaven is where God's presence is. And fallen humanity is imperfect. The imperfect cannot come into contact with the perfect. It just doesn't work. If we, without our forgiveness, were put into God's presence, we would literally be fried. Because we cannot stand the holiness. Think of uh, when uh, David was uh, sort of moving uh, the ark up to Jerusalem. Was it Uzziah or one of the guys accidentally put his hand and touched the ark, which was the symbol of God's presence among his people, and he was struck dead. That's how holy God is. And you must be holy to enter into the presence of holiness, if that makes sense at all. So we couldn't get to heaven. We couldn't. We tried. We tried with the Tower of Babel to reach up there, but even that was impossible. We, could, we couldn't get that high, and even then God said, no, 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 no. You're not going to get your way back to heaven. I'm going to do it for you. And this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
Because he is the self, he is the person who prepared a way, who made it possible. The second part of our quote. Christ did not ascend on high in order to present himself before the presence of God the Father. Rather, he who of old was the word with no part or lot in human nature has now ascended in human form so that he may appear in heaven in a strange and unusual manner. So, think of it this way. God, or in particular Jesus Christ, all right, who is the eternal word in the beginning of the gospel, you know, in the beginning was the word. He comes to earth and takes on human flesh, uniting human nature to the divine nature. They're, two, they're inseparable now. Jesus redeems that nature by giving himself on the cross. Okay? So he's redeemed it perfectly, making the perfect sacrifice, overcomes death through the resurrection, and finally ascends into heaven in that bodily form. His spirit didn't ascend into heaven. He himself, he, he was bodily ascended into heaven. So he brought human nature into God's presence. And because of that, we are allowed to follow him. A long time ago, I, uh, when we were beginning this study, you might have noticed I got really excited because Jesus at the very, very beginning of John's gospel was talking about how before the end of this, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You know, Jacob's ladder that he sees in Genesis. It's an illusion. But Jesus, is that he sets that ladder up. He connects heaven and earth. That's Jesus. So our last quote. And in this way, transfer the glory of adoption through himself to the entire race. Because Jesus has come to heaven in human form, eternally uniting human nature to the divine nature, we are allowed to follow him. We are adopted and made sons with Jesus. And I know what you want. You want more quotation, right? <laughs> All right. This is Cyril of Alexandria. He says, I shall not say that he, oh, this is him sort of quoting Jesus in a way that, that explains what Jesus just said when he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He says, I shall not then, he says, depart to prepare mansions for you. They are already enough there. The mansions are already there. There is no need to make new homes for my creation. But I go to prepare a place for you because of the sin that has mastery over you in order that those of you who are on earth will be able to be mingled with the holy angels. So, the dwellings were already there. God has always wanted us up there with him. He's always wanted us in heaven. We just need the means to get there so that we can be where the angels are. But now, when I shall have accomplished the work of uniting the world below with that above, remember, he's the latter, giving you a way of access to the city on high as well, I will return again at the time of regeneration and receive you with myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. Jesus is not going to be separated from his disciples forever. Uh, in Christianity, there is sort of a, there's an idea of already but not yet. Jesus has saved us on the cross, redeeming creation, creation, but that work will finally be fulfilled at the last day, when he consecrates the whole world to himself, the wedding feast of the Lamb that we've talked about a little bit. That's what's going to happen. And there we're going to be eternally united to Jesus Christ. So, Jesus' whole mission can be summed up as him coming to redeem human nature so that we can, in a sense, be brought back into the Garden of Eden, to be reunited with God. We were kicked out. Jesus is bringing us back in. Guess what else I got? Just kidding. Good more. <laughs> so, at this point, Jesus sort of transitions. So the disciples, they really don't understand what Jesus is talking about. It's easy for us to sort you know, holly hindsight. Um, it's easy for us to, uh, to know what Jesus is talking about because we have the full story. The disciples don't. The disciples are afraid. They're uncomfortable. They're anxious. They don't know. They have no clue what's about to happen in just a few short hours in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the next day at the cross on Golgotha. They have no clue of the troubles that await Jesus and themselves. And so, uh, Thomas asks a question. He says, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? 
And Jesus gives the answer, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which I'm sure the disciples really appreciated. But it's an allusion to the, the, to the divine revelation of the Old Testament, of the three offices given, to, to, uh, given by God to the people. So Israel is established uh, in the Holy Land, and what do they have? How does God communicate to his people in management? He uses priests, prophets, and kings. These are the three offices given to God by the people. And Jesus is making an allusion, saying that he is the perfect priest, prophet, and king. You know, let's dive more into that. First off, priest. We have a quote from Hebrews chapter 7. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a new sort of priest. But the duty of the priest, back in the Old Testament and during the time of Jesus, really, is to show the people the way to God. And this was done primarily through sacrifice, right? You would sin. Well, you had to go to the temple. You had to give an offering. And the priest would present it to God, sacrificing, sacrificing it, therefore reestablishing your relationship with God. The priest was sort of the mediator, but really he was the priest was the gateway to God. The priest was the means by which the people got to God. That's how they could establish their relationship with him. So it's primarily done through sacrifices, you know, goats or lambs or cows, pigeons. Um, and another quote from Hebrews. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So, the former priests, they were plenty, but they were passive. They were just people. But now we have a new priest, a better priest. A priest who lives forever. <laughs> the priest is just oh okay. The priest uh, who doesn't offer animal sacrifices. Those animal sacrifices could only do so much. Our new priest offers himself, not a goat, even if it's a nice goat. <laughs> Jesus offers himself, who alone is perfect. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. So, Jesus is the perfect priest because he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, as well as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the way. He is the means by which we reach the Father. He's the means by which we reach heaven because of the sacrifice he made for us. It's a sacrifice that he never has to make again, but it's a sacrifice that counts or forever. It's redeemed all of creation, that moment on the cross. He did it for all eternity. So, Jesus is the way by virtue of his priesthood. Everybody tracking? Good. Next, prophet. Jesus is the truth. And Moses says, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. Now, the purpose of the prophet was to make God's, make God's will known to the people. The duty of the prophet was to tell the people the truth about God, about what God expected of them, about what God wanted to do. And the prophets, man, they probably had the worst job of all time because the people kept on killing them. It's terrible. But the prophets, and the people wanted to kill them because the prophets were so unrelenting about what God wanted the people to do, and the people did not want it to happen. My favorite story is the prophet Jeremiah getting thrown into a cistern because he made the people so mad and he was stuck in a muddy cistern for like several days. So God spoke through the prophets to make his will known to the people. Well, Jesus does this perfectly because he alone perfectly executes the will of the Father. What the Father wants, Jesus does. Jesus is the perfect expression of the Father. <laughs> Jesus is the embodiment of the Father's love. And what is God? Or in, what is it? What is love? God. God is love. Right? And that's expressed in the saving work of Jesus. So he's the perfect image of the Father's love. He is the best prophet 
we could ever hope for. He is the perfect prophet. And as he says in John chapter 5, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Right here in Deuteronomy. So, Jesus is the perfect prophet by virtue of his ability to perfectly portray the Father, to perfectly give us the will of God. And the will of God is that we might be with him. Finally, he's king. And from 2 Samuel chapter 7, And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The job of the king was to ensure the well-being and life of the people. The king ruled, but his responsibility was to his subjects. He was maybe he was almost in a priestly role in that sense, in that he sort of answered to God for how well he established justice among the people, how well he ruled, how well he defended the people. And Jesus perfectly embodies that as well. One of the Old Testament passages or from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation in you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What does this prophecy talk about? Yes, Palm, Palm Sunday. Jesus uh, fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah. Coming on the foal of a donkey, Israel's true king. There's also the donkey and the other end of the story where Mary was thrown the donkey and the Bethlehem. <coughs> That's another good one, yeah. Mary rode the donkey into Bethlehem. Also, uh, in Matthew 2 2, when Jesus is a baby right after he's born, Three old wise men come up from out of the east and they say, where is this new king of the Jews? They knew. They heard it. Jesus is the promised king. The king promised that God promised to David and his descendants forever. He's the king that the Jews have been looking for for centuries for deliverance. He's finally there. And he offers them salvation by entering into his kingdom. He offers us salvation by entering into his kingdom. And our entrance into the kingdom is through our baptism, where we, are, where we receive the benefits of his atoning sacrifice on the cross and are brought into his kingdom, his body, Christ, his house of God. So, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He has a very little tidbit at the end. So being the perfect priest, prophet, and king, Jesus is the only one who can perfectly bring the Father to God's people and make him known. He is perfect. He fulfills the categories. No one can do it like him. But that's not the whole reason why he's the way, the truth, and the life. It's not the whole reason nobody can come to the Father except through him. There's a very special reason. reason. And that's because... Jesus Christ is inseparably, inseparably connected to the Father because they share the same substance. Every Sunday we say of the same being with the Father in the words of the Nicene Creed. That's because Jesus, which is God the Son, and God the Father, they are both God, yet separate persons, different roles. Does that make sense? So, Jesus can perfectly show us God because his role as God the Son is to make the Father known, to glorify the Father. That is his role. It doesn't make him lesser to the Father. He's equal to the Father, but his role, his identity, is that of Son. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? There's a connection that can't be taken apart. And that really makes it so much more significant that Jesus took on our human nature and molded it to himself, grafted it to himself. He united our nature to God. Man. And what he's saying really is the disciples do in fact know the Father because they know the Son. Jesus is the image, the icon of the Father. If you know Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, 
You know the Father and you believe the Father. You cannot separate the two. It is impossible. The disciples, remember, they're trying to figure out where Jesus is going so that they can follow him. They want to follow Jesus. They don't want to lose their best friend. They don't want to lose their teacher. But we know from Matthew, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So when Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and he commands us to follow him, what does that mean? It means that we take part in the cross. Jesus himself was crucified. We must therefore crucify ourselves in order to take part in his life. Does that make sense? We're called to take up our cross just as he did. That's what it means to be on the way. So the way to the Father is made possible through Christ's atoning sacrifice for us on the cross. The truth of Jesus' identity is clearly revealed in his victory over the cross. And finally, the cross is the means by which we are given eternal life. The cross is the answer. The cross is where Jesus is going. That's his throne. That's where he fulfills his purpose. On this instrument of torture, grisly torture, he turns it into an instrument of glory, an instrument of the world's salvation, the instrument of all of our salvation. But to follow him means that we take up that same cross. That's what his disciples all did. All of them, in their own way, took up their cross, mostly through their brutal deaths. But we are also his disciples. Where are we picking up our crosses? far from easy to take up the cross. It's amazing how confident what Jesus was right before he knew what was about to happen. But, I mean, he, in the garden he even sweat blood over it, though. But, he, remember, he's trying to comfort his disciples. So he just dropped this news on them, but he also says, don't worry. You're not alone. When I'm gone, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will be your help. So, through the Holy Spirit, and we really can't get into it anymore, through the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to take up our cross. We're empowered to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit is what empowered the 12, you know, dumb disciples to take on an entire empire. It spread Christianity from the upper room in Jerusalem all the way to the Spain, really, all the way to India, as far north as Britain, and as far south as, I mean, Lord knows how far south it went in the Apostles' lifetime, but it's because of the Holy Spirit. So our mission tonight is to take up our cross and to rely on the Holy Spirit, which was given to us in our baptism. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. Help us, your disciples, Lord, to follow the way that you have set, to take up our cross, and to daily walk in your footsteps, in the path that you have already tread, so that in the end, we may be with you in the place you have prepared for us. That's us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.